Hey everyone, welcome to the second episode of the Ancient Presence podcast. In this episode, we talk with Alan from the YouTube channel Sacred Geometry Decoded. We had a great conversation where we explored topics like the possibility of lost ancient high technology, the moving and lifting of megalithic stones, and the mathematics of the Great Pyramid. Alan's a bit of a skeptic, and he guided us through very simple explanations of how the ancients could have achieved these things. We learned a lot, and we hope you do too while watching this episode. Before we get into that though, we want to thank many of our new friends over on Patreon. Zuni Picarelli, Reed Clemens, Kyle Delisle, Dick Meisterling, Chuck or Oanis, and Peter Schell. Thank you all so much for supporting us. It really helps us to continue putting out content like this. Be sure to like, subscribe, and share with your friends, and leave a comment down below and let us know what you think. Enjoy the episode, everybody. Okay, so for today's podcast, we have an interesting guest we've been looking forward to for quite a while now. This is Alan from the Sacred Geometry Decoded YouTube channel. Thanks for joining us today. We're looking forward to a good conversation. How are you doing today, brother? Very good, thanks, and thanks for inviting me. It's a real pleasure and look forward to it. Great. Yeah. Uh, one one way that we uh, originally came across your channel, actually Milo introduced me to your channel and uh, the way, you know, we, we both, I think he first introduced it to me as a geometry channel, like uh, you drawing geometries and things, which I'm very interested in geometry and uh, the works of Buckminster Fuller. And uh, I've gone through many different stages of like drawing flower of life and other sacred geometries and and then it wasn't until later on that i actually uh, he he's been following you for quite a while but i i wasn't introduced to your egypt and uh archaeology work until much later and so how maybe uh if you could just like kind of guide us through how that progression happened for you you went from geometry you started as a geometry channel correct yes it was watching there's a great uh series called secrets in plain sight by scott onstock oh yeah and that's, that's, a, that's one of my favorites yeah and was it 2010 i watched this and and my life was never the same really after mm -hmm. that because i got really interested and it was more beginning with places like washington dc and then I started investigating, like, our national Campbell, uh, capital in Canberra mm. has all of the same elements and design in there. And then I sort of followed the you know, follow the money and followed the architects and then come across places like Brasilia and Astana, which have the same, not just the geometry and the measurements in the building and that type of thing, but also the same legal status as well. And that was a real sort of rabbit hole to go down and, then that I started looking at uh, architects like I M Pay and Norman Foster, especially Norman Foster, who was the, mm. he's like a rock star architect. He's you know he gets all the really important big new buildings, but he was the chief architect of of Astana, and and it was sort of just you know following this trail. I was more skeptical. I still am. I try and be. I'm. I, I do look for alternative. I, I like you know I'm interested in that i love science fiction i love fantasy and that type of thing as well so I'm, i like that idea but then it was like you know following the physical money trail seeing that these patterns happen and then i just started working backwards in time and and then it was i arrived at ancient egypt and basically by going from uh, modern times then back through to greek and roman times and then looking for the origins of certain patterns in architecture, places like the Parthenon and the use of uh, three, four, five triangles in there, the Vesica Pisces, the two to three ratio, musical harmonies, things like the quadrivium and the old uh, style of, of teaching, especially back in the Middle Ages and so forth, uh, especially through cathedrals like Chartres and Cologne. And uh, also looking more into Freemasonry, I think, is just like the broad term for it. It invokes a lot of emotion, but there, there's a whole depth into there. And there are also other groups, odd fellows, uh, druids, and who have just basically going back through to the craft guilds and how they originated and 
and also not just the architecture itself, but also the social impact of, of those groups and how they were a big influence on things like public health care and uh, but basically our modern world, you know, and uh, that we have now and are really important in the union movement and and advancing working class people. But now when most people hear Freemasons, they think rich princes. But see their origins begin with humble stonemasons, stone cutters, and uh, the old craft craftsmen who were not only protecting their trade but also uh, widows scheme, pension schemes, scholarships for their kids, setting up hospitals, that type of thing. I think that was the most interesting thing really that I found was for me personally was the social aspect of, of these groups but their origins, for instance, the Freemason symbol are all ancient tools, you know, embedded in, in, in stonemasonry especially. Mm. But it was, yeah, it was more I worked backwards rather than began with an it. Like, personally, ancient history was never my fate. I was, uh, modern history was what I studied and, and, and favoured. And it was, yeah, it was just going backwards and looking for the origins of these things and the proportions in buildings and so forth. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really easy to um, start to look at modern buildings and recognize the sacred numbers that are repeated throughout, you know, yeah. Freemasonic buildings and whatnot, the same ratios and divine proportions. And then you look back in time and start to realize those numbers were known throughout medieval Europe and the, they're built into the Gothic cathedrals. And then you look further back in time. I can see how it's easy to just start from the modern era and progress backwards because you look all the way back mm -hmm. to Egypt and there's the same numbers, the same knowledge of mathematics and um you know deep embedded wisdom into their into their architecture which they saw as sacred and then you got to ask how far back before egypt and mesopotamia does it go and uh you know people have obviously been studying astronomy and measuring the shape of our planet and sailing around the planet and using like you talk a lot about the systems of weights and measures using number as one of the common um mediums for um, transmuting knowledge and information and also wisdom and yeah it's it's quite quite fascinating stuff you know when you when you look to the great pyramid and you see all the numbers encoded in there and then ask like one of my big questions and I would love to hear your opinion on that is um, whether or not I mean one of, one of the big fascinations that we've had for many years is whether or not there was some kind of a, a lost ancient civilization from times of prehistory and if any of this knowledge might go as far back as, you know, five or six or seven or 12,000 years ago, or even before the end of the last Ice Age. Um, and a lot of people believe that, and there's definitely a lot of open conversation about that online and in, in lots of books. As many authors are discussing this in YouTube channels and documentaries, you know, the lost civilization. And if there really was one, which maybe there was, maybe there wasn't, there, there's really not a lot of definitive, tangible proof. Um, but I speculate that maybe um, some of the knowledge of mathematics and the geodetic measure of our planet and things of this nature, knowledge of astronomy, the knowledge of the precession of the equinoxes um, may have originated from a very ancient time, maybe before Egypt. And um, yeah, that's, you know, a very interesting topic. It's really controversial, of course. So what do you think about some of that? Do you think that it was the Egyptian? I mean, you've we've commented a bit back and forth that you, you were speaking of the Indus Valley civilizations in India and Mesopotamia and Egypt who had a common system of weights and measures. Um, so do you think they were the people maybe five, six, seven thousand 7,000 years ago who really kind of, uh, you know, discovered some of this really profound uh, mathematical knowledge? I'm torn exactly what it, like, I, I think that could be one possibility, but it, firstly, like, what is a civilization versus a culture? Now, for instance, on the Danube Valley, you have Divana and Vinca, what they define as a culture because they don't quite tick all the boxes of what is a civilization or there's uh, like the Archaim in Russia where there was a big copper trade was happening there and now it's not again doesn't tick the boxes of a, of a civilization so I think the, the term even civilization for some people might be a bit uh, confusing because it's like that everyone before a civilization was just unorganized and didn't have any sort of bureaucracy or, 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 or scientific systems, let's say, but uh, people were 
definitely trading and over large distances and and so, for instance, copper, you know, is a sophisticated, you need to mine it, you need to smelt it, and then to travel over time. So I think that, for instance, they have a Mahenjadaro vale using a system of measurement which corresponds to the Old Kingdom copper and, and gold Devon. And it's, I think it's too much of a coincidence that they're so close to one another. And the system of measurement used in Mahenjadaro turns out to be 1.1 English feet, for instance. But what's again, you can follow that through time and where they still were used thousands of years later. Now, for instance, the, the Mahendra Dara system, 27.3 grams, that's the copper uh, Deben in Egypt. But then the Romans and Greeks were using that, and you still find ceremonial coins made of that particular weight um, as well. But my personal, the way I lean towards it is that civilization the bureaucracy needed for it began with trade because you see like the oldest writings uh, tend to be inventory lists and complaint letters between merchants and that it was the complexity of long distance trade that really pushed writing and record keeping and maths and navigation more than anything sort of forward and so it's also what for instance the bronze age collapse trade kept going on i think through that mechanism of trade like the distribution of knowledge but also the necessity for standardized units of, of measurement navigation it all sort of links links up together and i think that it, it, yeah I, I think there was they were more advanced before the indus and egypt than what what is accepted but technically doesn't tick all the boxes of being a civilization but it's 90% of the way there. And it's, uh, but I, I, it's the evidence for it. So I, I can't say that, you know, it's, these are my ideas, but it's a leap of faith to, you know, how to get there. It's, it depends what, which, what you want to believe, um, you know, in a way. So I'll, I'll always try and to train myself to go for the least fantastic mm. and, and look for the mechanism where you sort of at least can find some circumstantial evidence at the very least for the lack of definitive evidence. Mm -hmm. So along those lines, do you, th do you feel like a lot of this, uh, my thoughts immediately go to like Atlantis and uh, a lot of the stories of, of all of that. And when I, you know, for years was really fascinated by the stories that Graham H Hancock would tell of like yeah. a, 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 how a lot of this, uh, there is a lost civilization that goes back far back into prehistory and the younger Dryas and all of, the, all of that. And so for me, it's, it, I guess... I'm, I'm be through watching channels like yours and and a few others. I've become more skeptical of of. It's helped me to maybe ground a lot of these ideas of grandeur and really search for uh, the simple explanations. Uh, whereas maybe I would jump to more grander conclusions before, but I guess maybe I just want to get a clear understanding of do you do you. What are, what are your thoughts about Atlantis and, and those stories of the uh, uh, high technology civilization? And uh, do, you, do you feel like there, there's still room for something like that? Uh, or do you feel like it's pretty, pretty clear to you that there's uh, simple explanations for how the, this very... Uh, high understanding of mathematics and navigation and all that arose seemingly out of nowhere. I, I lean towards, again, the simple explanation. I think there is room for that to now, uh, for instance, they did uh, studies of ice cores in Greenland. Yeah. And they're looking at the Roman period and they can literally trace, for instance, uh, the, the rise and fall, for instance, all the walls of plague, and then you can see the decline because of the pollution from the, the mines and, and the smelting. What they haven't done or what I couldn't find is that have they analysed it further back in time? 
And I think that they, if that's more than anyone, I, I want that to be true. You know, I, I, I sort of, you know, I, I, and I think most, but, you know, especially archaeologists if, or the Egyptian authorities, if this evidence come forward, what a boon for tourism, you know, this would be yeah, you know, great for them. And, and I don't think there might be some hardcore people who are like really dogmatic, but I, I think that 90% of you know, people are genuinely curious if that evidence comes up. Yeah, it's, you know, that's, let's look at that. I think it's very, yeah, it could be possible. Um, the example that's often cited is that we were horse and buggy and uh, 1969, there's your Apollo mission. It doesn't take very long to go from quite simple to, to quite, and we can see the rise and fall of civilization. That's basically the story of ancient history is these rises and falls of, of empires and civilizations, and they quickly um, come back again. And if you can quickly re-emerge, then the, the seed could have quickly uh, popped out there as well. It's just a, based on what there is now, I'm not a, a big, I'm not interested in, in, in Atlantis in that way because I just haven't seen anything that really grabs me, but I definitely wouldn't say it couldn't have happened. And I think that's that's. The, you know, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, you know, as, yeah. as they say. But I just want to yeah, give me like more. Of, I want something I can hold and you know, get my teeth into, so to speak. Uh, so along sense, yeah. along those lines as well, uh, you know, Milo and I went back and watched one of your older videos uh, regarding. I think it was the the mathematics of the Great Pyramid, and in there, uh, you mentioned Graham Hancock and 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 the star shafts and uh it you mentioned him in a way that uh it it seemed like you you were in interested and in, uh in his ideas and all of this and yet a lot of the other videos i've seen from you it, it maybe seems like uh you've changed your your perspective on a lot of that and and it made me curious like what is your perspective on the mathematics of the great pyramid for one and also the works of people like Graham Hancock and Robert Bavall and uh, the star shaft theory of how it points at uh, certain stars, uh, the shafts in the, the King's ch uh, chamber. And, and also the alignment. I'm really curious about your perspective. I, I've heard you, um, you know, criticizing the theory that the alignment of the pyramids uh, matches the alignment of Orion's belt at the epoch of 12 and a half thousand years ago. So the star shaft theory and the alignment of the pyramids on the ground compared to Orion's belt kind of go hand in hand and are kind of separate because, you know, the star shafts more or less point to what, four and a half thousand years ago, the certain stars yep. that would align to them. So I'm curious your thoughts on those two different um, aspects of it. Well, it was through Graham Hancock and I saw some of his documentaries back on the tv days before the internet was a big thing and uh and also read you know some of his books so i have to thank him so he did pique my interest uh in there uh but my opinions did change over time uh because i my you know just the debunking so let's just i actually sort of began that many years ago and I, and I, sorry back then it was more civil than what I am now. I have to admit I'm a little bit of, uh, aggressive in my words at the moment <laughs> on my own channel. But I, I did, uh, if I could just, look, when I first started, I was in the so-called alternative community, but I started posting some videos saying, well, hold on a minute, they, this is what Graham Hancock says about Baalbek, that the stones would be crushed under the weight of the wood, but you know, you can look up the stats on, on what wood supports not a hard thing to find and it's just not correct or or that the rope would break under that but it's you, know, you can find the uh, tensile strength of, of hemp fiber and it's more than capable on, on doing that and then I found myself being pushed you know to the side and, and, and you know people would stop commenting or you know I'd start to get little nasty little comments and stuff like that as well and uh, there's a I don't know if you've heard of Clive uh, Prince and Lynn Pinknet. No. Pinknet, sorry. Well, they're very alternative researchers and they're very much into, uh, you know, this alternative area, looking at the origins of science and, and uh, 
or all things, you know, hermeticism. And they did a lecture where they wrote a book called the, uh, I think it was called the Stargate Con. And it was, they were just fact-checking, you know, not being poo-pooing the ideas, but just saying, hold on a minute, like, for instance, this is not actually correct. Mm-hmm. And and they found themselves black banned by, you know, once they were on the inside and then they found themselves being pushed out because they were going against the uh, the narrative, even though they were still firmly embedded in the, you know, esoteric alternative um, community as well. And that was I, and when I saw that, I was really happy because it sort of tracked my own, own journey in there. And uh, there's a, so back to the original question before I waffle on, yeah. Through Duval and, and Hancock, I got introduced to you know a lot of these things. I found you know I found it very interesting. I think there are interesting questions you know to, to be brought up um, amongst there. So it's not like a, a blanket where I've just you know say no to everything. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's just more again. I was well because I worked in lifting and rigging. I knew certain details about ancient cranes and, and, and how these things work and all as well. It's not quite correct, you know. And so I started fact-checking, then I would read things about stone and you can't do this and it was wrong. How do you, you know, I'd look up stone stonemasons and I knew a stonemason in the past and I was wrong. Well, this is not quite correct. And that's that. And eventually that led to me, led to me picking up some stones and because I was challenged, people would say, well, that's impossible. You can't do that. So, okay, well, I got some granite and some sandstone and started rubbing. I said, well, that's, you know, you can. And um, and then, again, that sort of got me, well, by doing these things that didn't go with a certain line of thinking, you know, rather, you know, not that I wanted a medal, but it was, uh, you know, I'm persona non grata. You know, how dare I you know, do this type of um, thing? So that, I've got skin in the game in that I really... It, it am alternative. I think we, you know, we need to constant, constantly be re-examining the, the past and looking back and maybe, you know, readjusting you know, as new evidence emerges and you know, readjusting our opinions. Uh, but, um, yeah, I find it's a little bit... I had a comment recently on another video um, and the person was insisting that I, I... What side am I on? You know, like that was a quick note. Whose side are you on? And it was... I'm not on anyone's side, mate. You know what I mean? I'm just, you know, give me the evidence, you know, and, and uh, if I'm wrong, I'll, you know, and just like any adult, you know, if you, new evidence comes along, you change your opinion. And uh, Yeah, you know, I I can really relate with that. Uh, you know, just in, our, in regards to our own channel, we started uh, very much on, you know, the alternative lost ancient high technology in some ways. I, I was never like fully convinced that that's what was going on. But in a lot of ways, like when I would visit, I think I was more excited about it than yeah. he was. But <laughs> we, when we would go, when I would go and visit ancient sites, and I'd look up like information about them, the first things I would come across are like Brian Forrester and like some other sites, uh, some ch- other channels, and they were the most easy, helpful, just introduction to a lot of these sites. And I, there wasn't too many at that time, you know, f- six years ago five years ago there wasn't that many like academic uh fun explorations of these sites introductions to these sites so that was a lot of the first exposure i was getting when visiting them and uh over time you know i've i've become less convinced about a lot of it i'm still very interested and like i'm interested in uh exploring all of that and you know, just through some of the comments on our YouTube channel like, that are very similar of just like almost, uh, you know, it's kind of full spectrum. There's people who think that we're full off the deep end, lost ancient high technology people. <laughs> and then there's also the lost ancient high tech people. They think we've people sold that, out. Yeah, they think we've sold out. <laughs> and so there's just, I'm not really interested in choosing sides. And I think that's really why we've, you know, we with these podcasts, what we want to do is invite differing opinions uh, so we can all just kind of, uh, talk about uh, the disagreements that we have and also the yep. the the ideas that uh, the new discoveries that we're making uh, and not really kind of see this as something to be fought about because I really think that on both sides of the polarity there are really interesting things to be explored and 
Yeah. So I, I can really relate with you on that. Like we're, we're not wanting to choose sides or even have it be a thing that there is sides on, but more uh, a really fun exploration of human history and yeah. leaving yeah, it at that. There's a lot of nuance. Needs to be a, yeah, because for there's some things that, so for instance, Atlantis, you could say it's subjective, you know, and, uh, you, you know, unless you've got a time machine, some things you'll never really be able to sort out or, you know, some ancient text appears which confirms things. But then there are also the objective facts, you know, that you, you know, that are just like there on the ground now. Uh, for instance, uh, you know, regarding the stones and flatness and angles, these are mm -hmm. obje you know, objective. And I think that if to investigate anything, you have to, whether it's the pyramid or the seraphim or those types of things, you have to, well, what is there? Um, and but so often you'll hear things that are just object objectively untrue. You know, you can sort of like, even from Google Earth, you can see that the blocks are not precise and there's a lot of mortar used in there. But that's sort of, that's one of the things that ticks me off is that you have people visiting the pyramids and they'll say it's, you know, every block is precision and, it's no mortar in there. It's like, well, look over your shoulder. You know, like I can see it. <laughs> it's right there behind you, you know, and it's uh, uh, when I first started as well, because, well, again, to Brian Foster and those type of channels, they're producing great footage. They're visiting those sites and, and getting people interested. So I, I can't take that, you know, that's good for them, you know, for doing that. And, uh, but it's just when it comes down to those, very specific details when they, you know, if someone tells me that two plus two equals five, um, no, no, it doesn't, you know, like, uh, yeah. 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 And, and I think one way f that I've seen that we can help, uh, navigate this, this ocean of disinformation is to really create a, uh, an environment, a learning environment where everyone is safe to be wrong. And yeah. so I, I've, I've, there's, you know, there's a big difference in people who know that they're wrong and they continue to sow like seeds of disinformation uh, out of this, out of a need to be popular or to make money or whatever. You know, that's just, you know, that's a moral issue. Uh, but I guess, I guess one thing that I, I, I've observed about learning in education spaces is how we can. And, and I hate the term like safe space really, but it's more, it's more in, in this regard of like, how can we hold our, uh, mm, hold the truth in a way that isn't, uh, at the, at gunpoint basically. Like if you don't have the truth and if you don't know the truth and, and what you're purporting is wrong, that it doesn't have to be, uh, your whole character is uh brought into question or whatever where people can actually be like oh yeah i was wrong about that and in this group of people i'm allowed to be wrong and actually i feel uh like i don't have a my guard up and and need to protect this wrongness you know mm -hmm. so uh, it's it's a it's a learning process on our behalf of how to navigate in this in this realm because a lot of uh, I, I personally want to have conversations with academics and also uh, there's been a little bit of worry on my end of like, you know, if we have too many talks with lost ancient high technology people, all of a sudden we can't have talks with academics, you know, so yeah. how to go about it in the right way. And Yeah, there should be an open dialogue, you know, it should be like a space where we're all learning together. But unfortunately, there's a lot of tribalism involved where people choose sides and then once you've convinced yourself that your theory is correct, then it's it's easy for you to want to defend your standpoint and then judge others. And then it creates this kind of duality, this polar polarization between people. And I find that unfortunate. Um, that's why we're really interested in, um, you know, continuing our learning process through keeping an open conversation about all this stuff. But also, like you said, really look at the the tangible evidence and call it out when it's wrong. Uh, for example, the Serapium and things, sites like that, you know, most most alternative people want to look at that and jump right in line with the idea that it 
it was a lost form of high technology and there's no way you can move those boxes into those hallways and like you've stated in in a, a plethora of your videos now like a lot of these people haven't even done a single experiment on how to do that they haven't even looked into the ancient uh, primitive techniques like wedges and pulleys and um you know primitive methods of moving stone and i i really appreciate that about your channel you show that 300 ton obelisk being moved in was that italy in the 20s yeah. or 30s or something yeah that was quite fascinating um the way they maneuvered it down the hillside through the town through the streets under a tunnel using the um the kind of uh, v-shaped planks uh, they were elevated on the outside to keep it running on a track yeah. uh, down the center line and you know, it's it's really interesting, like, uh, the, the deeper you get into this stuff, you have to understand every little um, single individual component, like, how does a pulley work? How does a capstan work? How do levers work? Um, you can find characters like Wally, is his name Wally Wal Walsworth? The guy who moves Wallington? these... Wallington, yeah. Wallington, yeah. Who moves yeah. these giant stones alone, just using really clever techniques that he just kind of comes up with on his own. You know, it'd be really great. Uh, actually, I'm, I would like to get more into doing some of these experiments ourselves, because like you've said in a lot of your videos, a lot of the people who are proponents of the lost ancient high technology theory, they're not experimenting with any of this. They just say it can't be done. And then they defend that standpoint. And I understand they probably do some degree of research, but you have to do a lot of research to be able to make that claim, um, you know, decisively. And unfortunately, there's just not enough real experimentation. And that's great about YouTube because YouTube gives a lot of people the the platform to be able to experiment with, with this stuff. Like we've seen a lot of your videos of stone cutting in granite and the Scientists Against Myths channel. And um, I think it's fantastic. I love that we can all chime in. But um yeah, there's a lot of nuance and, you know, the mainstream definitely denies the mathematics involved in the Great Pyramid, for example. So I'd say, you know, poo-poo on the mainstream for, for not really getting on board with that yet. But also that doesn't mean that, uh, you know, the mainstream has it all wrong and we have to see them as an enemy, that the alternative theory is fighting against the mainstream. And if everyone's fighting against each other, there's not a lot of progress. So I love the nuance in the middle. And that's something I've really, um, appre I appreciate about your personal perspective on it all. And it's helped me a lot to kind of have a better, a better nuanced approach from my own learning process. So cheers to that. When, one fascinating thing about like the, the Serapium, for example, is not many people have actually read the original writings of Mariette who yep. went in and excavated. Uh, and Milo recently, uh, while we were working on uh, our Serapium video, he went through and translated the full uh, text from French into English using Google Translate, which was a huge undertaking. <laughs> it took me hours and hours. <laughs> and reading what Mariette actually described, he gave a full breakdown of first of all, wooden rollers that were found in the Serapium. Uh, uh, traces of wooden rollers. Traces of wooden rollers, yep. uh, yeah. And a winch. Two winches. And <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and how they lowered a box into one of the chambers because it hadn't been lowered yet. It was still sitting on sand in one of the chambers. And he had his men go in and lower the box themselves using buckets just shoveling out the sand. And this is something that is like, you know all for, for us to read and yet not a single person that i've seen talk about the serapium has even gone back and read mariette's yeah. account nobody talks about that stuff actually what's cool is you you and your video mentioned that method of using sand to lower a box and i was like aha yeah. that's the only time i've ever heard anyone mention that <laughs> well that's uh, i'm unfamiliar i've read passages of mariette that have been translated but i haven't read the whole thing i'm gonna have to go through and well, no, we have, we have we have it. We have the document. We'll send it to you. Yeah, we'll send it. To oh, you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, back to that point as well. I think it's not just in ancient history, but sadly, the internet uh, or this modern times, everything's become very polarized in where it is an us versus them situation. In well, across spectrum, you could almost pick any sort of genre, and you'll see whether it's, uh, I don't know, for instance, movies. You know, like you see, or um. Yeah, you know, that's how your Star Wars, I think, was the, the, the recent one. Either you're for it or against it. And it was just this crazy polarization where everything is, and um, we're losing yeah, that ability to, yeah, to, to have a little bit of nuance or whatever. Or, 
and everything's just yeah, it's negative or, or positive, and there's no you know, if you're not with me, you're against me type of um, mentality. It's just, and I, I find myself, you know, I think none of us are immune from from this as well. But that's uh, sadly the way of the world at the moment. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. But also, I would say that the oh, the I've also made videos criticizing the mainstream, um, especially people like Mark Lerner, because the experiments that, that he's done were just terribly done and, you know, like really, really badly done. Uh, can, he, you, he, can you expand on that? Move an obelisk. Like which, which, yeah, which experiments? I'd love to hear which, which ones you're talking about. Oh, there's one, for instance, when they carved the Sphinx's nose. And if you've uh, seen yeah. in it, yeah, uh, that was just horrible. Like the, the people were presented as, ancient experts in um, experts in ancient tools and they're getting a copper chisel and then they're heating it up banging it out and then going straight back to it but that's uh, i'm not sure if you know the difference between annealed copper and work hardened copper yeah but, we've, uh, yeah, we've it, learned it, about it from yeah. your channel when you heat it up it softens it again and when yeah you work and hard so you it, when it's to... cold it strengthens it yeah and that was just a very, you know, I, there's <laughs> nothing really good I can say about that. And there was one where they moved an obelisk and or a 20 ton block, and they ended up snapping the rope. But what they had done was have, uh, like from the hardware, they had squared blocks. And so as they're pulling it across, because it's, uh, you know, so flat and it, it creates a suction cup effect. So, and what you need to have is eat like with that, um, the monolith that they moved that uh, in, in Italy, what you do is you have rough bits of wood and so that the grease doesn't create a suction cup effect mm -hmm. and sticks it off. And, and I think that gives, when people see those and they say, aha, you know, that, that yeah. disproves it. But sort of rather than be critical, that's one of the curiosities to me is that Egyptologists are wrong, but then you say, well, they could use pulleys to move a stone. But then they say, but Egyptologists said that we don't have pulleys, you know. So it's like when it, when it suits them, they're the, uh, the authorities without question, but then it doesn't work the other way. And I think you, you always have to be asking questions and mm. there's, you know, no one's above, you know, making mistakes. We, we, you know, we, you know, we all do and, and not everyone can know, you know, everything you can, so you have to go to, you know, go to an expert, someone with experience and, and you know, learn from what, what they can do and look at their, yeah, their knowledge base and trying to incorporate it in into yours as best you can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, just about like the authority of the Egyptologists, um, how when they say they didn't have certain tools, um, that's often used to support the lost ancient high technology theory. Um, and it can go both ways, right? I mean, like when we say we haven't found certain tools in the archaeological record, um, doesn't mean they didn't exist. And that, that same argument could be used to debunk both sides of the same argument. And I find it quite ironic. Um, but it is very interesting what you just brought up about the, uh, the experiments and how they, um, you know, pe like people who, who support the lost ancient high technology theory are looking at the experiments of, you know, Mark Lehner and Dennis Stocks and using that to say that's evidence that the, that they're wrong, that they weren't doing it as well as, you know, the evidence that we find. Um, for example, the tube core drills. Um, this is a really interesting subject. Um, and that's why I really like uh, the work of Scientists Against Myths and, and your tube core drills as well. But they did one long one, and they had a video very specifically debunking the Petrie's core number seven. And they, they got those high res photos from the, um, the museum in London. And I just thought that video was so clear cut and straightforward that they compare them side by side and show you they're, they're the same color, they're the same length. They're really like exact, almost replicas of each other. Ironically, though, the modern one was much more of a helical spiral. And it was such a nicer shape. It was cleaner looking. It was more yeah. polished. The, the spacing between the, um, the grooves were more equidistant. And I like the way they played a little trick and said, aha, see the... The ancient one was done better, and then they said, "Oh wait, actually, we we mix it up and they switch them and show you the modern one was actually <laughs> much better than the ancient one." And people are thinking that there's this continual groove that there would have been some 
unbelievable amount of pressure from a machine 500 times with 500 times greater force um, or more efficiency than what we have today. And it's like, hang on a second, 500 times greater efficiency. Like that's a huge number. Um, that's like a really, really, really extraordinary claim. Um, and there's only one tube core drill. And, and I love the way you present this whole argument in so many of your videos and you just kind of rip apart the whole argument. Um, but ironically, like you've said, people still show that one video of Dennis Stocks like in the 90s or whatever with one little tube drill that took them many hours and uh, and they use that to debunk the whole the whole um, narrative about that. It's just such an interesting subject, mm. man. It, it's so fascinating, all this stuff. Well, it, there's a lot of... Uh, now, instance, the technique that you use to drill, just to how you add the abrasive, how much... Uh, water you use these will create little subtle little changes in in the style and so like again the science against myth one like when i did my first call they were a mess because i i just i just small little improvements first increases the, the cutting rate but also the, the quality and so my first one was you know eggy looking it wasn't circular but just by rotating so every five minutes i just rotate the position um, around the core and so that bias in the tube then gets cancelled out and so then you have a perfectly uh, circular tube uh, and even so so your yours was kind of oval shaped like instead of around yeah, the circle. first ones was yeah if you look from the top yeah it was a little bit oval shaped and you could see that one side was sort of tapered a little bit more than what the other side was because i was cutting it from one particular angle and from that i was able to uh, there's an, some footage I always use. There's a, a, a granite box and they've got some tube uh, drills in there. I don't know if it's a pretty popular one, but now I look at that and I go, ah, oh, I know that was a noob he was doing. And I can see that there's these mistakes in there. And I go, ah, oh, I know what he, you know, he didn't rotate his position. And, and then he come back, you know, an hour and then he started from a different angle. And that's why you had these sort of like little shelves on the side of, of, of the core as well. And yeah, but it's just, um, I, I did a bunch of them and but the same with uh, granite cutting as well. It's my experiments, you know, it, that's like me rocking up on the first day of work, you know, and doing a few, I was there, I worked until lunch and then sort of went home and, and you know, but all, the tiny little changes will, greatly increase the speed. Now, for instance, that Dennis Stocks one, they mentioned, I'll always show that, and he will say he gets four mil, mils an hour. But uh, he's using desert sand, which has a, and it's uh, a low, lower amount of quartz in there. So you don't really know how much organic material or, or limestone dust or you know other material has got in there. But if you just have a better abrasive, and the Egyptians that they had silica sand, they still mine and uh, mine that now. In the Nile Valley, they had corundum, which is as, as good as diamond. Uh, but so even Dennis Stocks, that clip that they show in his book, he talks about the, the cutting rates that he did with later experiments and he did improve uh, on that from my own experiment. I wasn't even trying to be fast. I was just trying to replicate those uh, striations that have the circular saw pattern. So, for instance, I got I got about six or seven uh, mils an hour, but I, I wasn't trying to be be faster now. But but it's also now uh, what what they call it. So granite bench tops, for instance, um, uh, still to this day they use what's called a, a drags a, a a gang saw, and just basically a whole bunch of blades all in a row, and it's just pulling back and forth. Now, of course, they got it connected to. Uh, electronics, I mean, in electrical motor, the Romans were doing this same process, but with a water wheel. And so you have multiple blades um, running at one time. So if you're going to do a slow cut that's going at four mil an hour, well, just put another blade next to it. Now you're doing eight mil an hour because you're going to cut two trenches. And then if you add another one, you're going to increase your speed. And that was done in the past, but it's actually still done now. Now, for instance, that four mil cutting rate sounds pretty slow. But gang saws that they use to cut granite bench tops, uh, they cut it two and a half centimeters an hour. So they're still going. You know, it still takes them three days to cut you know, uh, through granite, and that's because it's a much cheaper method. 
because you know you basically just get a steel bar or or a copper bar put some sand in there and you just you know run it back and forth but you, with a diamond rope or with a circular saw they cut that they'll cut up to a meter an hour but it's very expensive because you, you know you have to get the you know to get the, indi- the the diamond embedded on there and so it's a it's a which one's more you know, economically efficient but still yeah still to this day we're doing this very slow and ancient technique they've just connected it to an electrical motor to make it uh, yeah, more efficient and i think that yeah, if that was sort of a little bit more widely known and then the, the people who are incredulous about formulas and how oh, that takes too long well your granite bench top probably took free that three or four days to cut as well and you wouldn't call that you know uh, uh, infeasible or whatever the term that they'll use to say and it's just more uh, i was born right on the cusp of uh, for instance Carp, when, I was a, when I was a boy, carpenters would use a handsaw and a hammer to put the, together the frames of a house. Um, you know, by the time I entered my adulthood, nails delivered on trucks and, and brought, you know, um, mm. prefabricated from the factory. And in, just in recent years, we've really lost touch with the old artisan uh, patience that they had to make. You know, that, that was, that's just been the standard. I often use the example of, how many people would think that butter is impossible because my mum used to have to churn it, you know, and it took hours to make a little bit of butter, but, you know, uh, now you just go and buy it and don't appreciate it. But in the past, things just took time. Um, you know, it's why people didn't throw things away because it, it wasn't a disposable culture and, and we've got so used to disposable, quick, you know, fast food, everything now, 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 I want it in five minutes that we don't really, we've lost you know, that patience. Well, one question I have about that, you know, it's it it's one thing to cut granite and, and straight lines and and do something like that. I totally see like and I've seen through your channel and through science, scientists against myths how it can be done, but I still don't quite have an understanding of how things like uh the cough cough Kaf, uh Kafre enthroned, uh the diorite uh statue of Kafre, how something like that with such detail and precision and beautiful, uh, incredible craftsmanship, how that can be done using the same uh, tools like uh, copper, copper chisels and pounding stones, uh, how you can get very intricate details and uh, finesse using those same, same tools. Do you have any insights as to how that can be done? Uh, yeah, I still use them now. Um... It's called a pointing tool or a pantograph. And to, so, for instance, the Romans made perfect replicas of statues. And uh, it's quite a simple tool. I don't know. And you can also use that on the larger. So, for the, the Bahu Bali sculptures that they made recently in, in India, giant you know, monolithic granite ones, uh, it was sort of with plumb line and ruler, but. Uh, you mentioned earlier, like I'll include the clip and some graphics of that, and you can see how people use this you know, pantograph still now to make uh, perfect replicas. For instance, in the Parthenon, when they did the uh, restoration just before the, you know, the, was it the 2004 Olympics that they had there in Athens, mm. what they were doing was taking shattered stone, so in regards to polygonal stone, complex shapes, but they're very, you know, uniform. They're still quite smooth and that's not, not a highly, you know, complex shape, but they would take shattered bits of stone that are completely chaotic, you know, 2000, whatever, thousands of random facets and curves and sharp corners. And then they would make them with new pieces of stone perfectly fit, you know, these pieces um, together. And they had basically unlimited resources, but they found that the, pantograph was the best you know the ancient technique you know was the, the best one to use mm. and so it's a, and even sort of modern sculptors as well i think that something that masons and sculptors talk about it is is you get the mason's eye and the sculpt or the sculptor's eye and when an artisan gets really good he can just see you know little differences and 
and you know, just you have a level level of skill that's a, uh, without making one myself, which you know, that's beyond my, you know, I, I can't spend the next 30 years developing, you know, yeah. a, a, abilities to, you know, to do a mason and sculpt. But if you, you, there are still sculptors out there, you know, who did a piece of granite and uh, they're on, on YouTube as well. And they just sort of start chipping away, but they don't have any advanced metro metrological equipment. Um, and they just make a paint this, you know, beautiful, beautiful sculpture. Or Kelly Macus was a, another one. And they were working in marble, but I have to say that the process of working in marble and granite is exactly the same, just that marble is a little bit quicker and, and easier to do. But if you can do something in, in marble, you can do it in granite. And he used, again, these uh, drills, um, saws. There's also something I want to cover in video soon, but uh, there's a skill that masons have. And for instance, I'll go around the block and they'll tap it with a hammer and they can hear... The, the cracks on on the inside. You know, sometimes it's really obvious, but then you know you see that a mason do it. But you can't. I, I couldn't hear any difference. And he's no, no. There's there's a crack in there, or there's a shear. For instance, in granite, there's something. Uh, I think it's called shear force. But if you, for instance, take a piece of granite and you just like bang it really hard it, with a stone tool, it'll create micro cracks in the direction that you've hit the stone at. So for, you know, so if you can not only sort of take off big chunks quite quickly, you can do them, well, I don't want to use the word precise, you know, but you can do them you know, quite accurately where you can take off a, a large chunk and it's just by you know, that, you know, that skill that they acquire in, in, uh, over years and years, same like with uh, yeah, in quarries, the, the same sort of thing as well, where it's, you know, um, I do an experiment and I'm still very clunky at it, you know, but I, but I get success. But then you can see examples of, you know, uh, especially in the, you know, less developed parts of the world where they don't have access, you know, to the machines and tools that, that we have now. Um, they get some old bits of scrap and some and some grass and, they, you know, they, they, they bang on the stone for a few minutes and they create a perfect, perfect split. And there was a video I posted not too long ago where it was just a collection of old black and white photos from stonemasons you know, in the uh, late 1800s and early 1900s. And you just, yeah, you see the skill that they do. Now, for instance, they, uh, oh, I can't remember in Port, but for instance, in the California, in, in most state capitals in, in, in the US, especially there, you'll see mainly on the East Coast, they do these beautiful column, you know, with the capitals on the top, with all sorts of you know, vegetation and, and in there, and that's as good as any, um, you know, anything you'll find really anywhere in the world or all, all in history. It's just, you know, beautiful, highly detailed. They had the advantage of steel and that would increase the speed, but you know, uh, if steel is the only missing component, then you know, that's not really a mystery sort of, um, I think it's just that, you know, they know what they're doing. They're really good at it. They, and I think the important thing is also they love what they're doing. That's something I've heard uh, a few stonemasons talk about where it's it's not just a job it's a, or a profession. It's also an, an art form um, as well. And I think, for instance, a lot of people, are, in a lot of artists, know they're not going to be rich, you know, and, and the, but, but they do it because they love it as well. And, um, I think that's also a missing element in there as well. I think there's a certain level of devotion. There are a few traditional Indian sculptors still working now. They mainly do restorations of old temples in India, but there's uh, one recently built here in Melbourne, but the one in Hawaii, the Aravan Temple. Oh, that's fantastic, you know, and... and uh, Sorry, where yeah, did you say that one was? In Kauai, Hawaii. It's on the island. Oh, Kauai, yeah. I think. Yeah. Uh, I recently had somebody show me a video of that place. Wow, that that is incredible. That that yeah. stonework. And they also, but when you see that they speak about the devotion that they have towards doing that. So again, it's not just the job; it's something you know more in there, and they really put their heart and soul. It reminds me of some big favorite books, Lord of the Rings, and, mm -hmm. and that you know, like when Sam approaches the elves and he's 
uh, you know, can you show me magic? And the elves are like, what do you mean? You know, but they don't know what magic is. For them, it's because they put their, everything that they, that they love what they do. And if they make a piece of rope, they make it really well and they put their, mm. their heart and soul into it. And so, or, or like that after C quite any, um, I probably got best of people then. But yeah, if you really love something, you do it really well. You know, you, you don't do it to become rich if you make money, nothing wrong with that. But uh, yeah, it's that, I think that devotion is something that's again really a patience and devotion you, know, you can bring down mountains there's nothing that can mm. stop you yeah. yeah yeah i love that and i think it really speaks to kind of a hidden uh element that it is kind of missing in a lot of our current world uh, the world that we see around us our culture uh that i i don't want to say i don't maybe i don't want to go that far but just this idea that when we we do something for the love of it rather than because it's paying us uh there's there's a certain presence about somebody that you come across who's acting out of their own volition rather than almost uh being enslaved by their own need to survive or to to appease others there's a there's a quality to the presence that uh is there yeah magical elven pres- presence if you will oh, yeah <laughs> So uh, wh- one th- thought that I had that came up while we were talking about uh, megalithic uh, stuff, and you had mentioned Baalbek earlier. Uh, when Milo and I visited Baalbek, uh, I expected to be blown away by the Trilithon stones, and and I was, and but I didn't quite foresee how... Uh, spectacular the the stone of the pregnant woman and the other stones that are in the quarry were uh and one fascinating thing that we found found while we were there is that all of the stones in the quarry are at a 15 and a half degree slope i have no idea why uh and it's curious to me like there's certain things that aren't adequately uh dis- described by academia or given a uh, rationale to that I I'm, I'm still, there's still so much mystery in the ancient world that uh, I think it leaves a lot of room for these lost ancient high technology people to like really go mm-hmm. wild with because there's nothing that I've seen that really gives an adequate explanation of things like that. Well, on, on that, uh, that pregnant mother stone, um, if you look, Underneath, there's a fine crack that goes all along um, the, the bottom part where they've started to hollow it out underneath. But if you, if you can get a good angle of it, that's basically following the strata of where the stone is from the quarry. So there's a little like a cliff, like a hillside just off to there. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if you can quarry the top of the block, and then especially with limestone, you can split the bottom bottom away and so i think that 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 stone and i've also uh, they pulled down their video because they got harassed too much but um yeah there's a the, the strata at that part of the quarry is that is about at that 15. Uh-huh. yeah yeah and so they take advantage you know that's the you know work smart not hard so they take advantage of of that and you can split it off never that also applies with granite quarries if you can find the strata there's that that's a, a weak point where it's just really easy to break um hmm. uh, break break the stone off my when i first saw it i thought my original idea was they did uh my original thinking on that was that it was at an angle that i'm going to use that to take advantage of the gravity with uh with rollers that, or something that's like what that. my that's what my thought was yeah yeah and then I saw this uh, other video and he's looking at all the strata, you know, the, the, the layers of the limestone there and it follows and it, you can even see where there's a crack started to emerge, not because the quarrymen have lifted it out, just because there's a natural fault already there to take advantage uh-huh. of. Well, that's really interesting. Yeah, Baalbek is a fascinating place. Um, there's so many different layers of different periods of architecture built on top of each other. And it was, you know, it saw many different battles and wars and epochs where different uh, civilizations took over and rebuilt and it was smashed down again. And then there's all these higgledy-piggledy blocks kind of stacked up in different strange little ways. And 
when you look at the the origins of the site, all the foundation stones are where you find, you know, you that's where you find the biggest stones. Um, so what do you think about um, Baalbek? Because one interesting aspect of the site is that the Romans built perhaps their most glorious temple or one of, or I think those are the biggest stones they ever moved for that temple at such a far distant reach on the furthest edge of their, or I guess not the furthest edge of their empire, but across the Mediterranean from their homeland. And that's kind of an interesting um, aspect of the site, why they would choose to build such a gigantic megalithic um, spot, you know, so far away and move these huge, gigantic, unbelievably enormous stones. Um, as far as I understand, the Trilithon are the three largest stones ever used in architecture anywhere in the world. It doesn't necessarily mean they're the largest stone ever moved, but the stone that was placed mm. into a structure in architecture so I've got a lot of questions. You know, a lot of people think that there's, you know, some lost ancient um, civilization from, you know, many thousands of years ago that, mm. that built the original site, and then the Romans came along later and added to it, and then the, the Arabs came and added to it again, and all that, you know, later construction got all mixed up. But what do you think about some of that stuff? Do you think the Romans really possessed the capabilities to move 800 or 900 ton stones and, and you know, raise them into the wall? and move uh, perhaps a fifteen or 1,600 stone out of the quarry and transport it to the actual site where they probably would have shaped it again and then it would have been lighter when they actually put it up into the wall. But uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on some of that. Well, I think the first thing is that that eastern part of the Roman Empire, like it said to be far flung, but that part of the world is one of the oldest urbanized you know, centers of civilization in, in in you could argue that Rome is Rome the city is actually the the far flung you know sort of part because these people have been um you know in agriculture and every, you know they've been doing it for such a long you know before Rome was still you know sheep herders while you know that part of the Mediterranean was you know fully advanced you know and um doing the furthest parts of uh, but in regards to them lifting, I, I, I have no no doubt at all that they could, because the, for instance, uh, the, the ladder and ob the obelisk that the Egypt that the Romans um, moved from Egypt to to Rome itself, uh, four hundred tons was uh, that obelisk, and and they and then in the fifteen hundreds the popes moved those obelisks obelisks once again because some of them had fallen over and they wanted to relocate some of them and to do that they didn't know how and so they had to go back to the roman roman text on how to do that so for instance those 800 ton trilithons or you just have a lifting tower on either side the one that they used for to move the obelisks and that that could get them up you now you, you'd only have for those stones, the trilophons, there'd only be two times we'd actually have to lift them, and you'd only have to lift them just far enough to get the rollers underneath. So you get it on the roller, then you can use the natural terrain because it's essentially the quarry and the side itself is of equal height. Um, the, the uppermost part of the quarry is actually above the, the temple, and the lowest part of the quarry is about 10 metres below the temple site. And so it's it's essentially it's a flat flat move. It depends on what part of a quarry those stones where they come from. But once you get it on site, then you only have to you bring it into position on the rollers, and you can you only have to lift it, lift it just enough to get the rollers or the sled um, from underneath. And they had the technology. You know, Romans had the tech to do that. There's an interesting story when they relocated the obelisk in 1500s in Rome. And they had to reinvent Rome, you know, they had to go back to the Roman records. <sighs> and they started lifting it up, and then the ropes started squeaking and and uh, and started smoking. And what the Pope had said, he he set up a gallows and said, anyone who makes a noise, you're going to get hung. You know, no one's allowed to make a noise to distract, you know, while this process is going on. Wow. And so <laughs> the ropes are squeaking, it's all about to go to school with. Then someone yelled out, wet the ropes, wet the ropes, because he was a sailor and he knew and it was, lifting is really based on sail rigging. So this sailor you know, yelled out, wet the ropes, and so they threw, you know, threw water on the ropes and it cooled the ropes down and allowed them to stretch a little bit. 
And so, uh-huh. again, little techniques can really improve, you know, can, a disaster and a success can be, you know, some, yeah, you know, some old sailor, you know, screaming out, wet the road. <laughs> Well, ironically, it all comes really back to sailing, doesn't it? I've heard you mention that a lot in your videos, that um, yeah. in order to be a seafaring people, you have to have the most basic knowledge of leverage and mechanics um, to utilize just putting up a mast and, you know, having tension to wait uh, to, um, you know, stretch the sail and to basically navigate in open seas with waves crashing and all this kind of stuff. And you just utilize that same those same methods and techniques into lifting stone and to moving stone. Um, yeah, you know, it, it, it's really fascinating. I'm still trying to imagine like, what's the name of this, um, this crane the Romans had with this wheel thing. I forget the name of it. They had a certain lifting capacity. That's described in the truth. If you're interested in like Roman tech, um, book 10 on the architecture by Vitruvius. And he talks about various types of now, for instance, the architraves on top of the columns on, on a temple. He mentions that the Temple of Artemis, um, one of them, they basically buried it and then used ramps to you know, to bring the blocks on. So something I saw very uh, interesting just the other day was the, the old London Bridge. They dismantled it in the 60s and then some developer bought it and transported it to Arizona. So London Bridge is now in a in the tourist town in Arizona, it's Granite Bridge. But there was no lake or riverbed that was all made later. So they actually put the bridge together in the middle of the desert. <sighs> and and they would fill and they filled it with sand. And so that they built the bridge on top of the sand. So it was holding up um, the arches you know, as they went rather than having to you know put piers in the water and Sorry, I've lost my train of thought of the bottle. Mm. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> well, I think I was, where I was going with that was the um, the cranes have a certain lifting capacity. So one of the arguments that people, you know, um, present is that you couldn't fit enough cranes around a circle and have it attached to one giant, oh, um, yeah. you know, stone coming out of the quarry or to lifting it into its place. How do you? Managed to lift all that and roll using rollers, you could bring it and approach the wall where the trilithon stones were going to be placed. But then you have to shimmy them into their place, and then how do you slide them the last you know five centimeters until they're perfectly flush? And um, it's still, I mean, either way, it's a logistical nightmare. Um, you'd need all the mechanical leverage you can, and and winches and levers and all kinds of stuff in order to do it. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's definitely impressive. It kind of blows my mind that anyone ever even tried that in the first place. You know, who who was the guy that said, "Let's try it"? Like, it just really, uh, it's so impressive, and it's very easy for people to look at um, sites like Baalbek and just claim that ancient people could not have done it. But um, it sounds like you uh, you think the Romans really yeah. were were capable of doing it, then, huh? <laughs> yeah. Well, for instance, that polyspastus, that that standard crane that that was basically an ikea flat pack crane for the legionnaires to use where you could just dismantle it put it on a cart and and then move around and that type of crane was much more like the one you see driving on the road so where it's got the long you know so it was designed to reach out and then lift back and put down and they're also able to swivel so yeah that but if you take those exact same components and rearrange them into what's called a, a hoist crane, you can now lift much further because one of the limiting, like for instance, the cranes you'll see on the road, the limiting factor is that firstly, the crane can't be too heavy so that it, it crushes, you know, it, it destroys the road. So that's like one of the you know, limiting. But the, the further, you, it's sort of like holding a weight. If you, you know, you can arm curl quite a bit, but if you try and, look, you know, if you try and like <laughs> lift it up like that, it's going to be, you know, you can only lift a fraction. So the further you are away from your center of gravity, it it reduces, you know, how much you can lift. And that's, yeah, that polyspastus was more like a one of those, you know, cranes that, you know, come to your to your house. But if you build a hoist crane, um, exactly the same components, just reconfigured uh, a little bit differently. It, it, now it's like the, the weight increases, uh, your, your capacity just goes up you know tenfold it's uh, 
Got it. Yeah. So okay. one one crane is more focused on um, maneuverability, the ease of bringing it to a site far away, moving it to the next site, rather than having it stationary in one position and much stronger. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. And for instance, there's a, a Tyson that's in South Korea. That's a all the components are exactly what you'd see on your normal crane, but they've just put a big frame. You know, and doubled them up, and that lifts twenty thousand tons. So up for here, well, we couldn't lift those blocks now. It's, you know, we could lift an entire <laughs> Baalbek complex in one go with, with a crane like like Tyson. And it, it's also you can put a, a hoist crane on rollers, so you can even move the crane as you go. But it's, those boom cranes are much more convenient. You, know, you can it arrives in the morning, does the work, and drives away in the afternoon. Yeah. But a hoist crane, it's more specialized. Interesting. Great. Uh, so, you know, we're almost out of time here, but I, one thing I would like to kind of touch upon uh, before we, we go is we've been, over the last few days, uh, Milo and I have been really diving into uh, the mathematics of the Great Pyramid and a, a lot of these sites. And it seems pretty blatantly obvious that the that the great pyramid itself encodes uh a lot of these earth measures and um and then the question comes up of like how did they uh have an accurate measure of longitude for example or um you know the the circumference of the earth and all of these things and so do you have any ideas of how how they could have that sort of understanding and encode that in, into such a giant architecture? Uh, well, look at uh, Erit Eratosthenes. He was the chief librarian of Alexandria, and he did one of the first Earth measures, which was very accurate. And he went to uh, just south of Aswan, there's a well of Syene, and he noticed on the uh, solstice I think, that the sun shine directly down into the bottom of the well so you know, and uh, so then on the same day he traveled to alexandria where there was an obelisk and he you know he noticed that there was a shadow cast by the obelisk at an angle and so he measured that angle and then the distance from from syene and then use use that to work out the the, the circumference of the earth so if that, uh, personally, I think that he didn't invent that experiment. I think that as, you know, the chief librarian, he had access to older writings and was mm. recreating um, an experiment. And, and that sort of relates to Roman tech as well, because everyone sort of thinks Rome and then Rome the city, but it was the Mediterranean world would get a better description of it. Rome was just like in charge of, of a, of a collection of, of civilizations but the romans themselves admit uh, you know the best roman engineers they all come from alexandria which makes them egyptian so we you know, mm. and I, yeah in the library of alexandria i think there was a, you know, a treasure trove of, of collection you know of, of, of knowledge and that well, yeah that eratosthenes for measuring the earth was i, I think would be yeah, personally, I think he was recreating an, an, an older experiment. And then you also have, uh, during the later sort of Roman periods, uh, they were doing, they had ideas of the distance, relative distance of the Earth to the moon and the sun and of the relative sizes of these. Now, it wasn't fantastically accurate, but it, it, it was good and it shows that, you know, we've, if they had done a few more measurements over time and had built up more data, that they could have got even closer to this, you know, very, very precise thing. But that's uh, so. When it comes to lost technology, I, we, we were, if we were just to lend Old Kingdom Egypt just a few of the tools that we knew that the Greeks and and the Romans had, that would go a long way to, to answering you know how they did it. It was just that. Romans and Greeks, we've got such fantastic writing. We know exactly what, what they are, but Egyptian records are a little bit scant. And I think that's also a difference between um, 
Romans and Greeks and other civilizations is that it was a bit more democratic, the idea of, of knowledge, as we can see in Mesopotamia and these other, they almost had a caste system, so it was very rigid. You know, there wasn't much social uh, social mobility, or basically where you were was where you were, but in, in, in Rome you can see how people come out of nowhere, they become very rich and then, then, then become an emperor, but uh, seems to be a little bit, there were people in Egypt who, who did seem to rise up from nothing and, and get a high position, but it's, it seems, a, as far as I know, you know, seems to be a, a Mesopotamia, Egypt, and the Indus seems to be a bit more, yeah, well, there wasn't much room for, for mobility, or, or at least not com, com, compared to the sort of Greco-Roman era. And because there's so many documents from the Greco-Roman era, uh, it's just fortuitous as well. It's yeah, sad, you know, how much documents have been lost or, even if they maybe had a mental, like even like we're on the internet, so this is all about exchanging information very quickly and very freely. But um, only two hundred years ago, even a map was considered high, uh, top secret, you know, knowledge. You didn't want a foreign navy having you know access to your maps to explore or you know to do some sort of ambush on you or whatever. But you know, modern, yeah, our modern, we exchange information so quickly, it's you know, in terabytes, but back then it was, mm-hmm. I think people were more protective of, of the knowledge. Same thing with masons and carpenters not too long ago. It was more of a closed shop. You know, you, you didn't want to teach people your skills because then they would take possibly take away your livelihood as well. So I think that might be another angle to it as well, but it's all, you know, my opinion, I, can, I can't prove, prove all of that. That's one thing that's that I've wondered a lot about is like how much of this information is locked in vaults and in private collections and uh, just kind of lost to history because, yeah, the Vatican, (laughs) how how much of it is lost to history because of people's protectiveness of the information or also just because it's a collector's item to have. Uh, We were were at a, a museum in Beirut, I think it was, and they had a whole uh, exhibit on, uh, artifacts that were retrieved back from pi- private collections and there was like whole granite boxes like giant that were in private collections collections in like germany and uh yeah. these are like you know e- egyptian artifacts that you know this is one thing i didn't realize also is the egyptian uh, art and culture extended further into uh the middle east than i previously knew like we were in beirut and there's like a whole uh sub genre of egyptian artifacts in in lebanon and uh and yeah so just seeing all of these ancient artifacts that were in private collections that nobody possibly even knew about until they were returned it's it, it makes me wonder like how much of that these amazing artifacts are still in billionaires private collections hanging on their walls and and you know who knows where yeah and along that same lines is just the uh the idea that knowledge itself kind of goes underground and can be transmitted and held in small groups of people um in their vaults or in their secret brotherhoods or initiate schools esoteric wisdom Mm. schools um and i think that there's a great deal of that when you look back through the history of Europe and the Middle East and Egypt and Mesopotamia, you find a lot of these common threads, like the uh, the modern expansion of the Freemasons is kind of a continuation, um, I feel at least, uh, from other uh, traditions that came before them, like the Bogomils, perhaps the Cathars, going back into the Gnostic um, traditions yeah. and back into Egypt. And it's so interesting when you find, like, for example, um, Egyptian symbolism embedded into uh, Freemasonic architecture and Freemasonic rituals and things like that. They're drawing all that knowledge and experience and ritual from Egypt itself as kind of the motherland of their their uh, their tradition. That's one thing that, that uh, Scott Onstott, uh, yeah. the Secrets in Plain Sight, really got me all interested in, is seeing how actually this religion of the ancient Egyptians could be still living today. Like there's some... Oh, yeah esoteric tradition that's still being carried out today so there's like all this hidden knowledge that is still yet to be made common knowledge 
Yeah, not just their their spiritual beliefs and their um, religious ideas and things of that nature, but actually their units of measure. And one thing I've we've been looking into recently, and I find so fascinating, is the the meter, and the way that the meter and the cubit and perhaps even the foot kind of make this, um, as Scott Onstott puts it, a, like a hyper web of interconnected um, systems of measure. And uh, I mean, if people have, haven't looked into it, they got to go watch Secrets in Plain Sight. You can go to his website, um, uh, Scott Onstott's website, Sacred, Aca- uh, Sacred Geometry Academy, and it's one of the free courses you can watch. He recently started a new website, and I recommend everyone to go see it. Oh my God, it's incredible, like the secrets that are hidden in plain sight and um, the knowledge of mathematics and the distance between sites and the alignments of avenues between obelisks and Rome. It goes so deep, man. The whole world is built upon, upon these ancient principles um, that essentially can mostly or largely be traced back to Egypt and um, and also their systems of measure. So the meter, as we know it today, um, was you know measured by the French uh, during, I believe, the Renaissance in the late 1700s or so. And uh, they, they got it to a very high degree of accuracy as um, measuring the meter as one forty millionth of the polar uh, circumference of the Earth. And they were off by about eight kilometers, more or less. It's more like 40, 000, 40 million, no, sorry, 40,008 kilometers. So yeah. one meter is one forty <laughs> whatever millionth and eighth of, a <laughs> of the polar circumference of the Earth. Um, and so when we find the meter, for example, interwoven with the, the Egyptian uh, cubit, and I know that the Egyptians had many cubits, um, and that's something I got a little confused on recently, um, specifically like the, the cubit that was used to build the Great Pyramid. Many people say it's 52.36 centimeters, which is exactly uh, pi times the meter divided by six which would be yep. essentially, uh, if, it, if you see the, the meter as the diameter of a circle, um, then pi times the meter as the base measure of one being one meter as the diameter, then the you know circumference of that circle is 3.14, and of course pi that goes on forever. Um, and then one-sixth of that would be the Egyptian royal cubit of 52.36 centimeters. Um, yeah. What do you what are your thoughts on that and and the you know the these numbers that are embedded into Egyptian artifacts and like the the king's chamber for example the perimeter of the king's chamber um, being pi times is it ten meters and things of this nature who do you think figured out the meter and who do you think figured out one do you think that they measured it as one forty millionth of the polar circumference and do you think they got it wrong and maybe the French you know five thousand years later measured it again but decided to maintain the ancient meter even though they might have known it was off by eight eight kilometers you know what you got any thoughts about that just to think like when it comes to metro- even ancient metrology now i would have said you know it's exactly pi over six meters but you always have to have a, a t- tolerance in there so you know there's always a margin of error that you, you know we need to account for and I think that they actually began small and uh, that they use things like grains or poppy seeds, which is still like the imperial system. And that, you know, for instance, uh, three barley corns is, is an inch and an inch is you know, uh, defined as the, the, the width of, of a thumb. And uh, so you know, 12 inches is a foot or 16 fingers. That's enough. And so the Egyptians weren't using the thumb, but they were using the finger. And that was also divided into 16 units as well, which sort of corresponds nicely. But so my person, um, you mentioned the different cubits. Now, there was the Old Kingdom cubit, was the one you mentioned there. But, but then there was the, around uh, time of Tutankhamun, there was another cubit, which was slightly longer. Um, I think it actually relates to timekeeping, because then you also have the Mahenjadaro unit of, so one, three, Three, three Mahendra feet turns out to be 3.3 3, you know, imperial or, or English foot. Now, if you make a pendulum out of that, you can create a very accurate one pendulum, one second pendulum. And the length of that arc turns out to be the Tutankhamun um, era cube, the uh, Maya rod. Would, would you mind if explaining you, that shortly? If you have a string that's one meter long and yeah. you pull it back... And then it creates a two-second swing, one second up and one second back. Is that correct? 
Yeah. Uh, so, so before the so the French, just to go back to that Earth measure, just like Eratosthenes measured a portion of the Earth and then was able to work out the polar circumference, the French basically started at the uh, North Sea coast and then went down to Spain and took that section and, and then they got the 40,000 kilometre uh, polar circumference. And, you know, that was, but people knew the circumference of the Earth even before, before that, but... Uh, what was going to the official meter was almost going to be based on a one second pendulum as measured at Paris, because the further you go north or south from the equator, the gravity slightly changes and then that, that changes the length of a, of a one, one second pendulum. And uh, that's what I think that's, you know, uh, I'm very, um, you know, sort of weights and measures. So we think, you know, measuring weight and measuring length, but timekeeping, I think, is one of the overlooked things in regards to, to the past as well. For instance, in Mahanjadera, they find little egg timers that are about eight seconds long, I think they are. But in processes such as chemistry, you know, you'd want, it's, you know, you, you'd want to be able, you know, if you say, this is how long you have to allow the reaction to happen. You, know, you can't just sort of say one Mississippi, two Mississippi <laughs> and, and translate that. You want something that's a little bit more, more accurate to put that type of uh, thing together. But, um, yeah, it's, it, this, oh, it'd be a whole long discussion as well, but that, that one metre pendulum, so a, a one modern metre as we define now, uh, for, firstly I should say, so in regards to the Vesica Pisces and that geometry, is that really simple 30 degree... Something like you know, your 30, 60, 90 set square. Now you can do hexagons and that's what, you know, the flower of life and all of that. Is, these are all the angles that are in there. But a, so a 30 degree pendulum, uh, it's very important that it's at no more than 30 degrees because if you, uh, so it's like when you're on a kid, you know, you go on the swing and you're swinging. But when you get up really high at that top point, you don't swing anymore. You sort of fall and then you, you start to swing again. Uh, so anything that's above 30 degrees will actually affect the, the length of timing so you can so like a grandfather clock they always swing at a shallow angle so it needs to be less than, than 30 degrees and uh it's a very simple geometry to do you know so you can uh to begin you know, so it's, and then you get the length then you can measure the, the one second but as i said the further you move north or south that changes the length. And so I think that's like why the Mahendra-Darrow unit is a little bit longer. Well, it does seem to correspond to that position on, on the Earth. And the uh, Giza Plateau is 30 degrees north of the equator. And that would make a very effective pendulum best. Uh, now, sorry, I, I got way off track. The <laughs> French meter was, de de was defined by that measurement of the Earth, but the original idea was to create a uh, one second pendulum as measured at, at Paris. That was almost going to be the concept of, of the, the meter. That was also the founding fathers in, in America there, they were, rather than use the English unit, they were proposing to use a, 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 a pendulum set again at 45 degrees to define the um, American yard and American foot, but that never quite took off. So... So one of my questions about that is, do you think that the French, who were lar likely the, the Freemasons of that era, um, possessed knowledge of the meter that had been passed down to them for perhaps, you know, 5,000 years, and that they kind of utilized that measure they already had and then kind of justified using the one-second pendulum at that length to kind of match the measure, the polar um, circumference of the Earth? Yes, uh, but I would also, uh, now the meter was technically defined there, but in uh, Germany, hundreds of years before that, they were using, and in Austria, they were using a foot, which was 333 millimetres. So their yard was, um, a, you know, they didn't call it a metre, but it was a, a metre in length. And these obsolete units, which have faded out, uh, of use, but there are still like sometimes recorded on the side of cathedrals. Uh, Riccioli was this uh, famous Jesuit. He did a lot of work on gravity and uh, published quite a bit on that. Uh, 
his original concept to, to develop a one second pendulum was to use it to time choirs because that was you know, just like a, a metronome. So we wanted to time, you know, to get this music and so that the music would be transmitted, you know, that, that song would be at the same tempo, you know, sort of somewhere else as well. But then it's this circular sort of chicken or the egg thing because he wanted to find the perfect second, but then he was um, by ear finding what he thought was the best choir and then comparing that, you know, to, to their timing as well. It's uh, when it, uh, I'm blundering here because it's such a it's it's a, like yeah, it's chicken or an egg thing. Um, is it this one or, or or is it this one? I personally think yes. I think it goes goes way back and and that's connected through the transmission of weights and measures and, and timekeeping um, especially because that's so important uh, now for instance the issue of longitude was only solved when they made the first uh, maritime chronometer and so be, being a so, so knowing how to keep time use time measure time can be vital you know especially in uh you know, n- navigation and, and, and that type of thing i think again that's one of the things where back to trade and navigation and seafaring so it's not just the the knowledge of the uh lifting equipment it's also that geometric mathematical astronomical knowledge that you need you know to sail the world with any success if you make a mistake out there you're you're wasted <laughs> there's no no coming back from it so you really have to be on the top of your game to do that type of uh yeah that trade as well and and, and even the the amount of trade that was happening in the ancient world. Now, for instance, the Romans were trading with India and they weren't following the coast. They were, they were sailing straight across um, the ocean there from the Red Sea. They come out the bottom and just go straight across to India. Again, if you're, you're not doing that well, if you'll make any mistakes, you're, it's, the sea is unforgiving in that sort of way and that, uh, and that forced people to, to, to be more accurate scientific and to investigate these things because if, mm. if you don't there's just no you know, mm-hmm. nothing to do um something that really interests me was pacific islanders and how they were able to navigate yeah mm-hmm. between um islands and because there were so many scattered islands that's fascinating I, 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 uh, one of the tricks was that they'd use navigating birds so you know so they know that the, the bird is going to go for the islands so you just follow the birds and it's going to lead you to towards the island another one was that the fresh water coming off the island would have um oil and it would sort of leave a streak on on and so you could sort of like a highway you know you could follow mm. this uh you know through into there but most amazing was something that they was called the matang and it was almost lost it was like one guy left in the marshall islands who knew how to read this but they could feel the reflections of waves coming up off islands and mm-hmm. and and so yeah, you know the wave would come off and they would yeah, yeah they knew how to and they would narrow in and fight and again if you're just a, a couple of miles off and you, you you sail past that island there's nothing for thousands of miles and so you you, you, know, you had to be on top of your, and of course you know they could use the stars and the sun so you have a combination of of, of, of different uh knowledge forms and techniques but the stars and the sun will get you quite close and then you'd have to look for these little trails of whether it's uh, uh, luminescence on the top of the water or follow the birds or um, mm. uh, and even look for leaf debris and there would be leaves floating off and again you could sort of just just trace those back uh, towards the islands but I think that's so much yeah navigation and trade for me personally is what I think was the driving force of civilization and bureaucracy and, and record keeping, as well as driving you know, scientific knowledge and, and, and just knowledge in, in general. I think that's uh, you need it, it to live. It's it's amazing how uh, the, these conversations kind of open up whole other realms of things that we could talk about. Like uh, this, I feel could lead us on a. I have like so many questions about like what we've read in America before. We just read uh, Graham Hancock's book this last summer, and uh, he talked about uh, the the native peoples of South America uh, potentially being connected to uh, Australia. Right? Is that 
um yeah papua new guinea i believe yeah. or the um forget the uh australasia yeah yeah and so it it makes me wonder how how far back these seafaring cultures went and how uh you know we c- there could have been world around seafarers uh, by accident even you know like someone stuck in a canoe that just gets sucked by uh currents and then all of a sudden is directed to uh somewhere they weren't intending to go and uh it yeah so this is a whole fascinating uh topic that i'm sure we could go pretty deep on i i personally have to to go uh, so i i think we have to wrap this up but uh it's been really awesome talking with you and i okay. i really one thing that i am grateful for through this is a lot of the things that i thought were uh, mysteries and hard questions to solve you've provided very simple explanations for and it just really goes to show like my own tendency to uh sensationalize and i really (laughs) i want to towards the extraordinary (laughs) yeah well and and it kind of makes me you know i want a lot of these very simple explanations to be more widely available and i i was you know i was talking with milo recently about how it is becoming really hard. It, it has been in, in the past really hard to come across a lot of this academic information because it's behind paywalls or it's through mm-hmm. universities or whatever. And so I, I would really love to see more YouTube channels and uh, public discussions about a lot of this because I think it would really do us all a lot of good, especially people like me who tend to sensationalize uh, these very simple simple things <laughs> and so I, that's one thing i want to grow in in myself is really looking to i guess an occam's razor approach to like yeah. you know the sim- the simplest answer is the the right one so <laughs> yeah but it, it you know it's it's pretty clear though that ancient peoples were were geniuses they were brilliant and they just were clever back then they didn't have the iphone you know they <laughs> they had the resources that they had and they they made the most of it. So that's that's what's interesting about all this is like um, the mainstream academics don't give them enough credit and therefore people have to kind of reach into the extraordinary realm and say, well, there must have been a highly, highly, highly advanced people with perhaps even satellites or whatever because their measurements of the earth were as precise as, uh, as ours are today. For example, the precision within the Great Pyramid um, you know, it's an extremely accurately aligned monument. And I just find it unfortunate that um, mainstream Egyptologists and uh, academics don't give them enough credit for the achievements that they that they were capable of back then. I mean, when you look at the Sockel uh, of the Great Pyramid versus the, like, the perimeter of the pyramid with including the Sockel or without including the Sockel, you get two measurements, which I'm sure you've looked into that, are indicative yeah. of half a minute, uh, if I get that right, half a minute of a degree of longitude and latitude at the equator, uh, which is incredible. I mean, it's extremely precise. We did the calculations on it uh, multiple times, and it it was very precise. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it, that's a brilliant um, achievement, you know, and I just would love to see that rather than uh, people shouting conspiracy that the mainstream Egyptologists are hiding the truth or whatever and therefore we need high technology and all this more extraordinary stuff um there's actually just a really simplistic explanation to things perhaps well and then you watch channels like uh world of antiquity which i i've very much enjoyed his videos as well he gives very uh grounded uh, explorations all this but even with the he did a video on these measurements of the great pyramid and he was just passing it off as if it was like kind of coincidence and that uh, that the Sockle d- and the and the Great Pyramid didn't have accurate enough dimensions, and that you could like really point to to really say definitively about all of this. So, didn't he also say that pi is not encoded or phi? You can't find these divine proportions. Like, have you seen that video, Alan? I would love to yeah, actually yeah, almost see you do a, a response video to that. I think that would be pretty <laughs> pretty well, interesting. Alan- well, one thing he says in there and you hear often is that you can use 
like that that's a number trick and you can use numbers to find um, anything. Yeah. And I've heard that before, but I would say, well, tell that to the tax department. You know, you, you can't, you know, uh, now because it's true if I take, you know, a series of random numbers and I multiply this by that, divided by that, you know, you know divided uh, by the number of dogs I had as a child and I can arrive at any number, <laughs> but we're, we're, we're talking about like just the, the height, the length and the width, these are inherent proportions that, and pi and phi, you can argue whether it was intentional, whether they knew they were doing that. that that's, I think, a legitimate argument. But you can't den deny that it's not in there. And you, there's no way you can cheat the system because it's it's height, length, and width. And you can't find, you know, those proportions are there. I think if you look at it, and because there's slight variation in, in, in each corner, that's sort of something else I looked at as well. And I think that they, um, for instance, the difference between the shortest and longer side is a 20 centimetre difference. For me, that's too big of a difference not to be in, intentional, because even just with a measuring rod and, and, and some measuring rope, even an apprentice would be expected to get you know sort of better than that. So I think that that might be something in there as well. But yeah, it's uh, de definitely I have to say it, it's there, and uh, whether they knew it or not, we can we can argue about that. But when when I hear people say, "Well, you can." find this number out of anything else no, no you yeah. can't you know take that try that at a shop or the, you have a tax department you know if your accountant starts making numbers out of anything you know you'll get a knock on the door very soon and, and, <laughs> and people will be saying sorry you know, that doesn't work like that um, yeah. but i think yeah, we all all have our own biases and and as much as i'm sort of critical of certain areas of alternative history Personally, I don't think that also the academic side or the orthodox side has done very much to make it accessible to other people. So, and you know, I think that's a failing, you know, on on their, their behalf, and that's why I applaud World of Antiquity because he's really, you know, there's not many people of you know of, from his area that are addressing this directly and, and and putting it so that people can can find that as well. So, as, yeah, again, or, or the critical of lost high technology type people, but they do show sites that you will never really see and, and that is, doesn't really get uh, as much attention as, as what they should. Mm -hmm. And yeah, but, you know, none of us are per perfect. I've made videos before in the past where I made you know a mistake and then you know, I'll, I'll pull it down and, and pull it up or try to redo it again or, or whatever. But uh, the, yeah, we as much as I criticise one one side, I think there's also you know, the you know, so-called academic. I even don't like that term because now it's become something where it's a, mm -hmm. a pejorative, you know, where, where people um, use that. But let's just say that the uh, the mainstream sort of type historians, people like Mark Lerner, you know, but uh, yeah, they're not maybe doing as a good of a job communicating to to the layman as as what they should do. Yeah, I guess we're all part of it. We're all playing our part, and it's good that there's so many different sort resources where you can look online and so many cool YouTube channels, and one of our mm -hmm. goals is just to show people the ancient world and discuss it and show people the details and get good footage of these sites, so we've been traveling a lot ourselves to these places, and yeah, when we all kind of are able to communicate with each other, we can learn from each other, and um, I find it all quite fascinating. Um, I would be very interesting, interested, though, if you um, perhaps would do a response video to um, World of Antiquities video. I don't know if that interests you. Um, but hey, before we wrap it up, um, we got a couple maybe quick questions. Just real brief because Casey's got to get going. But what are your thoughts on the um, concept of the speed of light being encoded into the latitude of the Great Pyramid? Speed of light in meters, per, uh, in meters yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I did a couple of videos myself finding it that there are a few other connections in there. And that's sort of, uh, so for instance, regards to pi, phi, cubits and meters, but just that geometry of the pyramid, uh, all they needed to do, do was put in the 22 over 7 ratio to get the uh, pi. And then everything else will appear within that because, because of the angle of, um, of the pyramid. And so it's, if you only have knowledge of one, all the others will appear there by accident. That's like a very curious thing that 
when you look at the cube and the meter and, and the pyramid that um uh how can i say it? that even if they didn't realize how deep it was it, i think yeah it's a, that's a, a a really really curious one but that, that there seems to be this connection between these mathematical constants uh, which just emerge at that particular geometry. Now, you, you, if you just to change it ever so slightly, all of those bits would would fall apart and they wouldn't wouldn't appear in there. And uh, yeah, that's a, I think that's more of a uh, not quite the theory of everything, but it's uh, one thing I've also noticed was the margins of error between some of these things in itself is uh, based on phi as well. That was something that I've never sort of published, but. That's what I think that, yeah, but there's, um, there are slight errors. That's not exactly perfect, but yeah, the error itself, I think, contains some information in there, but w whether it was conscious on their behalf or whether they just appreciated pi or, or phi, I, I, I really couldn't say. I, 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 I want to believe that they did, but I, I you know, I, I can't sort of explain, um, how that could have been. Uh, but the speed of light, there's a fellow called Ollie Roma who really come up. He was the first accurate or reasonably accurate definition of it. And he was able to do it just by uh, observing the um, moons going around Saturn. So even like getting to the speed of light or, or reasonably accurate doesn't take advanced machines. You know? And even if you see the first like really accurate measurements of the speed of light, it was basically some a uh, uh, bronze apparatus with some spinning mirrors and they were able to do it there. So even to get to that level, you know, yeah, it doesn't take, you know, laser beams and computers. People were able to calculate it just using some logic and some simple instruments. So that this idea that, you know, that they knew what they were doing, I in our last podcast with uh, Ben from Uncharted X, I brought up this idea that uh, perhaps, you know, just like a bee doesn't, create a honeycomb a honeycomb using hexagons which enclose the most amount of space using the least amount of resources just as they d probably don't think of it as like oh this is a hexagon and this is like this is gonna you know they don't think of it logically uh in the same way they you know they're they're using resources almost acting as a limb of nature's integrity patterns and so likewise how how can humans maybe humans of some Point at some point in human history have acted in the same way where you're they're not necessarily thinking of it as a logical statistical analysis like data point but it's actually yeah. just an extension of a spiritual uh cosmic principle embodied in them they are uh enacting nature's integrity principles without having to necessarily put it into numbers or put it into formulas precisely one of the questions for me is how much do you know this type of is built into our dna because we all tend to have yeah. the same aesthetic values and we all you know not everyone but most people sort of prefer the uh fire-based sort of proportions of you know length to height of a room but there's a feeling when you walk into a room this room's not right it's too skinny and too high you know but so, of course, everyone has their personal taste, but you do see all across human cultures that we sort of do come back to these basic proportions that seem to be the most appeasing, uh, appealing to us. And and that's a deep question, you know, like how much information um, computing power is in, in, our, in, in our DNA. It's interesting that uh, some of the researchers in the quantum computers are actually looking at the uh, DNA spiral as a possible model on, on how to build their, their systems and is there's something within us you know but uh yeah we're, we're not conscious too and how much for you know how much of our personality is in in our subconscious you know we just get this glimpse of at the front there you've probably you know everyone's experienced it where you try to solve a problem and then you walk away and then you're not even thinking you're having a shower you know and it, it always happens when you you know in, in the toilet or in the shower there's not a piece of paper there but you get these <laughs> all of a sudden these ideas appear to you and it's you're not conscious of it but you know we're yeah it's uh, very interesting i think um you know i'd love to be alive in a couple you know in the future when we 
we've gone a little bit further than where we are today to know. Well, and one thing it makes me wonder about, like going back to what you're talking about with like the measure of like uh, the fingers and all that, it, it makes me want to look into the proportions of the human body uh, in relationship to the proportions of the earth and how uh, maybe just by through measurement of the body and, and using measurements that relate to our body, we can spontaneously arrive at the measurements of the earth because of some relationship there. Uh and, you know, when it, when I've studied uh, a lot of like Buckminster Fuller's work, for example, it has helped me to understand uh, how nature's coordinating, through nature's coordinating, uh, everything that is within the biosphere is connected through these very uh, interrelated proportions and through... Th- so it makes me wonder then like us uh, humans as a biological extension of nature's uh, immune system, how we, uh, how the, our form can encode uh, fractally or a har- be a harmonic expression of a cosmic uh, body. And yeah. And so it, it opens up this whole avenue for me of like looking into those relationships of our bodies and the earth body and how it's all connected through proportion. Yeah. Well, we're definitely uh, um, a component to the, you know, the building blocks of all life and the great cosmic realm we live in. And I think it's so great that humans have been uh, encoding these type of proportions into sacred architecture and they're still blowing our minds today. Um, I think it's one of the coolest aspects about ancient cultures compared to our modern, more efficient, um, building principles of just put it up quick, make it a square and it's got four corners and a tin roof and all right, it's good to go. Mm-hmm. Whereas, you know, sacred architecture from from the past was um, really embodying these sacred principles of the interconnectivity of all life and the harmonic proportions of, of life itself in the universe. So it's uh it's something that'll never stop fascinating me every day i think about the pyramid and the 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 parthenon and just all these numbers and measures and uh how brilliant people were back then and they were they were more tapped in you know today we have light pollution um we're in a fast-paced society full of highways and roads and noise and traffic and back then people were really watching the heavens and using naked eye astronomy to... and yet genius is still alive amidst yeah. this chaos of <laughs> lights and sounds there's still genius to be seen on the planet totally well thank you so much alan uh this has been really great and i'm sure we could continue talking for hours and uh yeah, yeah. let's have it let's do another podcast sometime man it's great talking with you um no problem yeah. let's Happy recuperate day. and do it again in i don't know a couple of weeks or something a couple of months <laughs> so, yeah. well, thanks for having me it's been great having a chat and uh yeah i'm looking forward you know yeah I, it, these types of things you, you know spend months and years talking about now i think that's also one of the as long as you're talking and thinking and yeah, presenting new ideas and hearing others out you can always something to learn Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing the the learning process and thanks for doing so much teaching on your channel. Um, For people who are coming from our end of this um, podcast, definitely go to Alan's YouTube channel, Sacred Geometry Decoded. You've got so many cool um, tutorials about how to learn to draw geometry and and study the numbers embedded in sacred geometry. And also a lot of great debunking towards... um, you know, uh, narratives that you don't agree with, uh, um, and other YouTube channels. And you've just got a, a whole plethora of videos and information that people should really go through. And, and, um, we definitely recommend to, to check out Alan's channel. And don't be fooled. He's, he's very calm and, and, and nice here over on his <laughs> channel. He gets a bit r- wild and, and, uh, feisty, feisty. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, have a wonderful evening, Alan. Thank you. Yeah, take care, brother.